Good morning. Good to see such a great crowd in here today. You know something, I started to use the word magical, but I don't actually believe in magic, so I'm going to have to say spiritual, but something spiritual happened just a few moments ago when I stepped back here to put this gown on. When I put it on and zipped it up, all of a sudden I feel like I'm 18 years old again. <laughs> Boy, how I wish that was true. It's been a year or two since uh, I actually did officially don one of these gowns, but today is a very special day for six of our graduates here at Faymont. Unfortunately, one of them is unable to be here with us today due to a death in their family, and they had to make an emergency trip to Virginia. But for those who are here, it's a very special day, and I pray it'll be even a little more special this year here at our church because of what's transpired and how crazy this year has been in our nation, and they were not able to participate in a normal graduation service as so many of us have over the years. So I pray that you will help make this a very special part of their day, their year, their life, and just knowing and believing all that God has in mind and in store for them and how excited I'm sure they are today for this milestone accomplishment in their life. So at this time, would you please stand with me as we honor our graduates. Some years back, there was a Baptist church, much like ours, that had a graduation service and recognition every year, much like ours. But one year, the pastor kind of caught everyone off guard because normally what they would do was actually allow each of the students to share, to talk about their experiences in high school and what their plans were in the future. But the pastor would say a few closing words and have a prayer, and that would be the end of the service. But one year he caught everybody off guard and his words were so poignant I just felt led to share them with you this morning. And he stood up in front of them that day and he said, Graduates, I want you to understand something today. You're all going to die. You may not think so, but you're going to die. One of these days, you're all going to die. He said, and when you do, they're going to take you out to a cemetery and drop you in a hole and throw some dirt on your face and everybody's going to go back to the church and eat potato salad. <laughs> but then he said the most important thing. He said, when you were born, you alone were crying and everyone else was happy. The important question I want to ask you is this. When you die, are you alone going to be happy while everyone else is crying? And the answer depends on whether you live your life to receive titles or testimonies? Will they list your degrees and awards or will they tell about what you actually meant to their lives? Will you leave behind a newspaper column telling people how important you were or will you leave behind crying people who give their testimonies about how they have lost the best friend they ever had? Will they talk about all the boards you sat on and the things you owned or will they talk about the money you gave away to make a difference in this world? There's nothing wrong with titles. They're actually good things to have. But if it ever comes down to a choice between a title or a testimony, go for the testimony. Pharaoh may have had the title, but Moses had the testimony. Nebuchadnezzar may have had the title, but Daniel had the testimony. Queen Jezebel may have had the title, but Elijah had the testimony. Pilate may have had the title, but the Lord Jesus Christ had the testimony. So what will it be for your lives? Titles or testimonies? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you this day. 
We just give you all the glory and the honor and praise knowing that you are the giver of all good things and that, Father, you have promised us to work in and through all things in our life for the good of those who love you. We believe you have done that very thing for these graduates that stand before us today, working in and through all things in their life to bring them to this very point and place in their life, a point of completion, but a point of also, Lord, a new beginning and a fresh new start and a time of entering into the world now as an adult. And so, Lord, for all that they have accomplished to this point, we thank you and give you the praise and recognition this day. We pray, Father, you would just fill their hearts with joy and uh, just pride in the accomplishment that they have done thus far. We pray, Father, your spirit would just fill our hearts and minds, fill this sanctuary this day as we rejoice and celebrate with them and as we give you the praise and the glory for it all. We love you, we praise you, and we ask you these things in Christ's holy name. And all God's people said, Amen. Be seated, please. Oh, sorry. Any one of the three songs where you would like to come up and just place your offering in the offering plate. Majestic is your name in all the earth. Oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. The heavens declare your greatness, the oceans cry out to you. The mountains, they bow down before you. So I'll join with the earth and I'll give my praise to you. Oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Heavens declare your greatness, the oceans cry out to you, the mountains they bow down before you, so I'll join with the earth and I'll sing, the heavens declare your greatness, the oceans cry out to you. They bow down before you So I'll join with the earth And I'll give my praise to you Let them hear you sing this today, church Sing it out loud I will worship you. I will worship you. I will worship you. I will worship. Louder, church, come on. We will worship you. We will worship you. The heavens declare your greatness. The oceans cry out to you. The mountains they bow down before you. So I'll join with the earth and I'll sing. The heavens declare your greatness. The oceans cry out to you. 
The mountains they bow down before you So I'll join with the earth and I'll give my praise to you So I'll join with the earth and I'll give my praise to you So I'll join with the earth and I'll give my praise to you Praise God. Give him a clap praise today. Hallelujah. I want to be close, close to your side, so heaven is real. Death is a lie. I want to hear voices of angels above singing as one. Hallelujah. Holy, holy God Almighty, the great I am.
at your feet I lay my past down My wanderings Hold my mistakes down And I am free Here at your feet I lay this day down Not in my strength but in yours I found all I need. You're all I need. Jesus, Jesus, at your feet, oh, to dwell and never leave. Praise the day. Hallelujah. Graduates, family members, church family, 
We are excited to be here today to not only worship our Lord and Savior, but to celebrate the accomplishments of the graduating class of 2020. And it's a pleasure to celebrate with you as you close this chapter of your life story. Parents, you're probably wondering where the years have gone. As you marvel at your sons and daughters' accomplishments, it doesn't seem that long ago when these young adults that we honor today were toddling off to start kindergarten. Of course, living through those years between kindergarten and graduation may have seemed like an eternity for the students and for some of the parents as well. You are the class of 2020. You were born in the aftermath of 9-11, and now you graduate in a pandemic. This is a time in history when our world is dealing with enormous challenges, but at a time when the opportunities created by those challenges have never been greater. Your world has always had metal detectors in airports and heightened security. September 11th was a historical event, not a tragedy that you lived through. That's hard to believe, isn't it? To them, it might as well be World War II or the Civil War. You are technology natives, born and educated in a technological world that was only found in science fiction stories when many of us in this room were in school. You have always had Wi-Fi. You never had to wait for dial-up internet. You Twitter and tweet, Instagram and FaceTime, read everything online, and you were only five years old when the first iPhone was released. And I have MP3s older than you are. <laughs> you are the generation that will take the technology of today to new and dizzying dimensions. You are the ones who will bring solutions to environmental concerns, such as conservation of natural resources, developing alternative energy, and other issues that our generation is only identifying. And who knows, it's very probable that some of you may even get to live on a space station, circling the Earth in a colony on the moon. Someone among you may find the cure for cancer or other debilitating disease. Today, you are ready to start a new chapter of your life story. Don't get ready. Be ready for all that the Lord has to offer you. You've heard many times that he came to give us life and that we might have it more abundantly. He has great things in store for you if you will surrender your life to him. You have proven that you are able to adapt to adversity as evidenced through this pandemic and the challenges that it brought to your final semester. Remember, life is a journey, not a destination, and it requires continuous growth and lifelong learning. But today, we honor you. Jared Perry. Jared has graduated from Douglas Bird High School. Jared plans to take a year off before deciding on his next step in life. Jared was always looking for ways that he could lend a hand. If you needed help and Jared was around, you could count on him jumping in to help without even asking. Jared was also the inventor in the group. If you needed a device or a gadget, Jared would always come up with a plan with something that would make do. On one of the Camp Grace trips that our students took, they, the guys wanted to scare the girls one night. Well, Jared said, hey guys, I've got a way, in which the guys immediately said no. Not that the plan wouldn't work, but the guys didn't want the lady chaperones in the cabin with the girls to kill them. <laughs> Jared Perry. a roll of toilet paper. <laughs> Go back to your seat. Alexander Wagoner. Alex is graduating also from Douglas Bird High School. 
Alex plans to take a, take a gap year. However, college will most likely be in his future plans, but the military service will also be an option. Alex is the quiet one in the group. Although he talked very little, he participated in events with excitement. Alex is very humble. He always puts everyone else before himself. Well, almost every time. On a trip that the teen boys took to the gun range, once Alex shot that AR-15 for the first time, he stayed in line for another chance to shoot it. Alex Wagner. Ellie McLeod. Ellie is graduating from Grays Creek High School. She is graduating with an academic letter and pen and was an active member of the Future Business Leaders of America for four years. Since Ellie's plans of going to Disney World got canceled, she plans to attend the University of North Carolina at Pembroke and major in elementary education. Allie would always keep it lively when she was around. One time she threw a cup, empty, thank you, Jesus, up in the air that hit the fan, in which the fan threw it back and hit her in the face, and we all laughed with her. Allie, or should I say Paige, was one of two that would assign everyone a nickname. Some would stick and the group would begin to call them by their new name. Allie also loved the kids. Her love of kids showed with her serving in our, children, our children's church, nursery, and vacation Bible school. Allie McLeod. <laughs> Tyler Michael Strickland. brought a fan club. <laughs> Tyler's graduating from Grace Creek High School as well. Tyler's a member of the Honor Society and a member of the basketball and baseball teams. He plans to attend the University of North Carolina at Wilmington on a baseball scholarship. He is a great friend and listener. He has been very dedicated in excelling in sports, especially in baseball. Tyler has eaten a zebra cake for breakfast every morning since starting high school, and he has eaten the same thing for lunch every day during his senior year. A ham and cheese sandwich with mustard, is that correct? <laughs> Tyler Strickland. Devin Penn. Devin is graduating from Liberty University High School. He's a member of the Sign Language Club. He plans to attend Liberty University to major in special education. Devin was always quick to form friendships with new teens that came to the student ministry. He made them feel welcome and made them feel as they were a part of the group. Devin has never met a stranger. He will speak to anyone that is willing to talk and waves at every passing car when traveling, including on the Washington, D.C. mission trip where one passing motorist didn't seem to care for a friendly wave. <laughs> Devin Penn. Chris mentioned earlier, uh, we have one graduate who is not with us, Savannah Willette. We still want to recognize her as well. So uh, Savannah Lee Willette is graduating from Village Christian Academy. Savannah was a four-year member of the varsity softball team, a member of the key club, and a member of the mock trial team. 
During her high school tenure, she participated in various school mission work in and around the Fayetteville area to include Operation Inasmuch, the Fayetteville Urban Ministry, and the Head Start Learning Center. Savannah plans to attend Western Carolina University for nursing and afterwards pursue a career in nursing. She's very compassionate. She's willing to sit and listen to those who need someone to just listen. Savannah was the mama of the student ministry. When someone would act up, she would be one of the first ones to say something to them and bring order back to the group. Savannah, before you leave the group, they want to hear her say one more time, you're not buying any more stuffed animals. So give Savannah a round of applause, even though she's not here. And I want to close this part of, of our service today with something that I used to read to my students on the first day of school every year. And I feel it is even appropriate as, as these folks graduate. And it's entitled, All I Ever Really Needed to Know I Learned in Kindergarten. Most of what I really need to know about how to live and what to do and how to be, I learned in kindergarten. Wisdom was not at the top of the graduate school mountain, but there in the sandbox at nursery school. These are the things I learned. Share everything. Play fair. Don't hit people. Put things back where you found them. Clean up your own mess. Don't take, don't take things that aren't yours. Say you're sorry when you hurt somebody. Wash your hands before you eat. Flush. Warm cookies and cold milk are good for you. Live a balanced life. Learn some and think some and draw and paint and sing and dance and play and work every day some. Take a nap every afternoon. When you go out into the world, watch for traffic. Hold hands and stick together. Be aware of wonder. Remember the little seed in the plastic cup? The roots go down and the plant goes up and nobody really knows how or why but we are all like that. Goldfish and hamsters, white mice, and even the little seed in the plastic cup, they all die, and so do we. And then remember the book about Dick and Jane and the first words you learned? The biggest word of all, look. Everything you need to know is in there somewhere. The golden rule and love and basic sanitation, ecology and politics, and sane living. Think of what a better world it would be if we all, the whole world, had cookies and milk about three o'clock every afternoon and then laid down with our blankets for a nap. Or if we had a basic policy in our nation and other nations to always put things back where we found them and cleaned up our own messes. And it's still true no matter how old you are, when you go out into the world, it's best to hold hands and stick together. Graduates, we are proud of you and excited to share in this celebration. Remember as you move forward to accomplish what you never have, now listen to this, to accomplish what you never have, you must do something you'd never have done. Congratulations to you, the class of 2020, on behalf of your church. We look forward to, forward to witnessing all that God has in store for you. And at this time, we have a slide presentation we'd like to share with you.
If, if you would, go ahead and take a copy of God's Word and turn to Exodus 20. And we'll be looking at verse 17 here in just a moment. But um, this week, as I was listening, can't remember if it was a, a video that I was watching or a radio that I was listening to, I heard this uh, rabbi who was talking about marriage um, talk, uh, give this story. And, and it was about a time that he was at a wedding and um, kind of toward the end of it, he saw this here guy that he knew. Uh, um, the guy's name was Anu. Uh, and he walked over and he said, Anu, he said, it's about time for you to, to get married. You know, what's going on? And so Anu says, um, well, you know, I've, I've really have been looking. He said, well, can you not find someone that you, you love? And he said, well, it's a problem that I've got. He said, I've fallen in love a couple of times. And the rabbi said, well, then, if you've fallen in love, what's the problem? And Anu said, the problem is every woman I fall in love with, my mother hates her because my mother says I need a woman just like her. So the rabbi says, well, Anu, do you love your mother? He's like, I love my mother. Do you want to marry a woman like your mother? And he replies, I would love to marry a woman like her, but how am I going to find someone like that and so the rabbi said well let me give you a piece of advice go to your mother and say mom go find me a girl that you love go find me a girl that you think is just like you and I will date her so six months pass by and, and the rabbi sees Anu again and he goes up and he says Anu did you take my advice? He said, I did. He said, did your mother find somebody? He says, my mother found somebody. It was like a younger version of her, the spitting image. You know, it was so unbelievable. She talked like her. She walked like her. She even laughed just like her. And the rabbi said, so did you fall in love with her? He said, oh, I fell in love. I fell in love head over heels. It was so amazing. He said, well, then what's the problem, Anu? And Anu said, the problem is my father hated her. <laughs> you know, as, as, as we go through life, you know, we're, we've got to make decisions and the decisions that we make isn't going to please everybody that we come in contact with. In fact, I mean, it may not please uh, some of our family members. Uh, it may not please our, our friends. But we can't base our decisions off of how everyone else feels or what they think about us. Now, I'm not saying that we should go in and make decisions kind of haphazardly. You know, sometimes we have to take and we have to seek out some input to go along with us making the decision. Sometimes we may have to, to go and, and get guidance for the decisions that we're going to make. You know, just like these graduates today, they probably sought out some input and guidance from their parents on what their next move would be after graduation. Would it be to college? What college should I apply to? What field of study should I go into? Or should I go into a career? If so, what career would it be that I should go in? See, I'm not saying that we should make decisions based on what the world tells us we should do. In fact, during this pandemic that's been going on, at the very beginning of it, I heard a lot of people say, to, especially to the young folks, look around and see who is working, who is considered essential. You know, that was good in theory, but the problem is there's a lot of people that is essential that wasn't working. 
You know, in fact, um, th some doctors ha have come out and, and may even some scientists, I don't know, I mean, have come out and said, you know what we have found that during this pandemic with the gyms being shut down? Our citizens' well-being, physical and mental, is declining. All because that they can't get out and be in shape. Exercising is a stress reliever. It is a mental thing to exercise. It keeps your mind sharp. And then we have a governor who sits there and says, I'm following science, and yet he's kept Jim shut down for three months. That's all we're going to say about politics right now. But you see, many people are considered important in the roles that they do, not just the ones that were continuing to work. Something else that affects our decision-making is also the success of others. We look at others, we see them living a very comfortable and luxurious life. For our graduates, as they move on to the next chapter in their life, they will encounter folks that are highly successful in the chosen career paths that they will follow. In fact, some of them will study about how some of them have become so successful in their career. And some will be taught how to follow the same path as those who have become successful. You could say the grass looks greener on the other side. So we want to go to the other side. You know, Benjamin Franklin said, Who is it that is truly rich? He who is content. And who is that? No one. See, Benjamin Franklin was right. We as humans are never content on what we have. We long after what others have. And the Bible has a word that we can call this, and it's called covetousness. So today we're going to talk about what creates our happiness. Our happiness depends on us being content. If we aren't content with our life, then covetousness takes over. Nothing in life will rob you more than comparing yourselves to other people. Yet, we do it all the time, don't we? There will always be people around you that will have better grades for those of you who are continuing to go to college. There will always be people who have better jobs, larger vehicles, larger homes, and larger salaries than we will have. Now, I'm not saying that it shouldn't be our desire to excel in life. I'm saying that we shouldn't want it because someone else has it. We shouldn't compare ourselves to others. It was in the middle of the night that Keith Richards, who was a guitarist for the Rolling Stones, had a musical riff playing in his mind. And he woke up and he grabbed his guitar and, and a tape recorder, some of you may remember a tape recorder, what it looks like. Mr. Darrell's the MP3 player, okay? Um, uh, but anyway, he, he grabbed the guitar and the tape recorder and recorded the tune and then went back to sleep. After that, their front man, who was Mick Jagger, wrote the lyrics to go with the tune. Three weeks later, the Rolling Stones recorded that song and it became their first number one hit, both in Britain and in the United States of America. It was the launching pad for their fame. What was that song? Jagger penned the lyrics to that song. He said this. He said it was simply an expression 
of his frustration with the consumerism and commercialism that they found in the United States of America. Now, that song was released in 1965. So here we are 55 years later, and you could almost say that that song could be our national anthem because we are never satisfied. So where does our satisfaction come from? Now, let's take and look at your, your Bible in Exodus chapter 20, verse 17. If you would, please stand. Exodus 20, verse 17. Do not covet your neighbor's house. Do not covet your neighbor's wife, his male or female servant his ox or donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. Heavenly Father, Lord, we come to you this morning just asking you to open our hearts and for your Holy Spirit to pour into us what you would have to say to each and every one of us. Father, we just ask that you would allow your Spirit to move among us. Father, let it just speak to us as individuals, for it's in your name that we ask these things. Amen. You may be seated. So here we see the word covetousness. So what is covetousness? Covetousness is the dissatisfaction with the provisions that God has given you that leads to an obsession of having more. You know, isn't it ironic that the uh, climatic commandment is the very last one in the ten that God gave us? Do not covet. You know, it is that do not murder, do not lie, do not steal, do not commit adultery. It is do not covet. You know why it's the climatic commandment? Because every other sin flows from coveting. Whether you're talking about idolatry or adultery or murder or theft, every sin flows out of the dissatisfaction of what God has provided you with. Matthew Henry said this, the tenth commandment strikes at the root. Nine commandments, com nine commands forbid all desire of doing what will be an injury to our neighbor. This forbids all the wrong desire of having what will gratify ourselves. Godliness and honesty must go together. The true godliness consists in bringing every thought into captivity before our God. See, covetousness leads to so many other sins. There in our verse, it's, it says wives and, and servants. You know, it leads to sexual sin. And then it says ox or donkey or anything that belongs to your neighbor. You see, we see it and we begin to want. We start coveting. When Scripture warn, warns us not to covet anything that belongs to our neighbor, that can encompass a lot of territory. I mean, it could be because of their status. Maybe it could be because of their position. Maybe it could be because of the prestige that they carry. In fact, did you know that covetousness was the very first thing that led to sin, not on this earth, but in this Expanse thing that we call our universe. Coveting was the very first thing that led to it. See, in Isaiah 14, verses 12 and 14, it says, How you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. How you are cut down to the ground, mighty though you were against the nations of the world. For you said to yourself, I will ascend to heaven and rule the angels. I will take the highest throne. I will preside in the mount of assembly far away in the north. I will climb to the highest heavens and be like the Most High. There, Lucifer, who was part of God's highest angelic order, who had been given a vast responsibility by God, one day decided that he wasn't content with where he was on the totem pole. 
So he wanted to be number one. He wanted to be the main man. When Lucifer started looking at what God and the throne in which he sat upon, Lucifer saw the respect and the reverence that God had from all the other angels. And he thought, you know, I can do that. I can get what he has. And because of that, God threw Lucifer down from heaven and became who we call Satan today. You know, it's no coincidence that after God threw Satan down to earth, that Satan chose to use dissatisfaction or covetousness as the bait in which he would lure Adam and Eve into sin. See, Satan got Eve to looking at the one and only tree in the garden that was off limits. Instead of Eve, Eve seeing all the other trees in which God had provided for them, Satan got Eve to focus on the one tree that was prohibited. Genesis 3, 5 says, and this is, is Satan talking to, to Eve, God knows very well that the instant you eat, it will become, that you will become like him, for your eyes will be opened you will be able to distinguish good from evil. You see, Satan does the same thing in your life and my life today. He gets us to focus on the things that will distract us and make us look at the things that we will become obsessed with. He doesn't want us to be satisfied with the provisions that God has given us. He wants us to be dissatisfied so that we become consumed with envy covetousness, being dissatisfied with what God has given us. When you look at history, it is a desire for more that leads to rebellion against God and causes chaos in, the, in our lives and in our world. Now, it was Lot's desire for a more productive land that led him to Sodom and Gomorrah, which was full of sin and brought disaster upon his family. It was Jacob wanting more inheritance than his brother that led him to cheat and steal his brother's portion of the inheritance. Because of Achan's greed, Israel was defeated overwhelmingly when they went to do battle in the city of Ai. Ananias and Sapphira were struck dead by God because they lied to Peter and ultimately God about the amount of proceeds that they donated to the temple after they sold their property. See, we see some of the same scenes playing out in our society today. A man earning $100,000 a year steals something worth $100 and ends up losing his job. A man and wife who have two stable incomes and they give both of their jobs up to start a business together, they end up losing the business and the stable income that they have, all for a desire to have more. A spouse starts flirting with someone at work that, that becomes a full-blown affair and leaves her family behind, leaving a crushed and heartbroken family. See, these folks had a desire for more, but it ended up becoming less. Instead of more money, the embezzler now has no income. Instead of a better job, the couple now has no job at all. Instead of a spouse finding more love, she now has nobody to love him or her and no family to turn to for support. Covetousness is subtle and deceptive by nature. With all the recent rains that, that we've had, you know, um, as I, I've been mowing the yard, I've, I've been seeing all the mounds that's been popping up as, as well as over the farm there that, that we uh, live on. And so as I'm, I'm mowing, I always take a, a bottle of fire ant bait with me so that whenever I come up to a mound, I can take it and, and I can put the bait not on the mound but out around the mound so that the fire ants will go and take it and take it back in. But you know, here a, a couple of weeks ago, I noticed something that was just very odd after I put the bait out. I noticed the bait 
was kind of going the opposite direction than the mouth. So I started to investigate just a little bit, and I found out that there was a very little small mound of, of what we call field ants that was, was just off of the fire ant mound. And so these ants thought that they had found the treasure of another group of ants that was there. And, and so they were stealing something from the other ants, not realizing that they were fixing to poison their own colony. Now that's how Satan schemes against us. He baits us up to go to the things in which God has said no to us about. When we see someone with more than we have, we must be on guard. The hunger to beg, borrow, and steal our way into what is theirs may poison us spiritually. You know, Micah tells us about how poisonous this can be. In Micah 2, verses 1 through 2, says this, What sorrow awaits you who lie at night thinking up evil plans you rise at dawn and hurry to carry them out simply because you have the power to do so when you want a piece of land you find a way to seize it when you want someone's house you take it by fraud and violence you cheat a man of his property stealing his family's inheritance you know Micah is, is saying that by us having the greed or, or being dissatisfied of not or, or wanting what others have is dangerous for us. Because he says, sorrow will come upon you. Or in some versions it says, woe. That means that there's some destruction that is coming. There's some punishment that is coming. You know, whenever we start looking at what others have and we start coveting, there's always two myths that come up and we fall for. The first one is, I can have it all. You know, this is a popular opinion in America today. Whatever you dream, you can achieve and receive. If you work hard enough, there is absolutely no limit to what you can achieve. You can get it all. But the fact is that no matter how much we have, no how much we, we get, there's always someone else that has more and we're still not satisfied. Now Howard Hughes is remembered for his money and his bizarreness. Now in the early part of his career, he was known as a daredevil. He was a man who had everything and followed his dreams. He was a shrewd businessman a movie maker, a pilot, and an inventor. The wealth he inherited as a youth allowed him to do far more than most people could ever dream of. And he had an overwhelming desire to become a legend in his own time. He wanted to do more than anyone else. This compulsion led him to test fly the planes that he built. It, he directed the films that he produced. He wanted more power, so he dealt political favors so skillfully that two U.S. presidents became his pawns. He had ties to the CIA and to the mafia. He was involved in Watergate scandal. Documents were discovered after his death that shows his intent to defraud, bribe, and intimidate, and intimidate to promote his schemes. Hughes wanted to be viewed as a man who would succeed at whatever he attempted to do. But Howard Hughes became ill. Hughes felt that he had to control everything in his life. Increasingly, he lost touch with his luxury schemes and focused on his immediate surroundings. His obsession with germs is legendary having doors and windows sealed and taped, forcing attendants to follow daily rituals, and spreading paper towels on everything around him to form a barrier of insulation. 
this would now be called obsessive compulsive order. In the last 20 years of Hugh's life, he was a prisoner to his own obsessions. See, Howard Hughes died believing the myth of more. I can have it all. The second myth is, if I could be happy, or I could be happy only if I had. You know, each one of us has a God-sized hole that only God himself can, can fill. But some try to fill it with jobs, bigger houses, extravagant vacations. I mean, we all think that there is something out there that will just make us happy. But do you know what most people will fill that blank in with? If I could be happy, or I could be happy if only I had more money. See, for money, it is a passport that allows us to experience the things that we think will genuinely make us happy. The Bible warns us against the love of money. 1 Timothy 6.10 says, For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. And some people craving money have wandered from the true faith and pierced themselves with many sorrows. Jesus even says that it is impossible for man to serve God in money. Now, he didn't say that it was impossible to serve God in your job or God in your recreational activities. No, those things can be idols in our life. But there is something unique about the lure of money. Money is unique in that it requires, in that it, requ it is required to do the things that we think will provide us happiness in life. Solomon, the most wealthiest man in the Bible, tells us that money is not what we think it is. See, in Ecclesiastes 5, 10 through 12, he says, those who love money will never have enough. How meaningless to think that wealth brings true happiness. The more you have, the more people come to help you spend it. What good is wealth except perhaps to watch it slip through your fingers? People who work hard sleep well, whether they eat little or much, but the rich seldom get a good night's sleep. Has any of you ever heard of Parkinson's Law? Not Parkinson's disease, but Parkinson's Law. Parkinson's Law says this, that work will expand to fill the available time. So here's what Parkinson's Law basically does. If you say, I've got two hours to do this project or to do this job, it's going to take you two hours to complete it. It doesn't matter whether you can have it done in an hour, you're going to fill that time. So if you have something that you allow two months for, for a project, how long is it going to take you? Parkinson's Law says it's going to take you two months because we are human and we are set to procrastinate. We use all the available time that is given to us. And right here, Solomon has given us a similar law. As available money increases, so will expenses increase. See, the more money you have, the more you will find to spend it on. Have you ever noticed a little kid whenever they get a dollar or five dollars? You know what they want to do? Mama, Daddy, I need to go to Walmart. You see, they've got some money, so now they want to go and spend it. And that's what Solomon's saying. If you get more money, your actions is going to be to spend it. He says you will never have enough. Solomon also points out something very interesting here. Have you ever heard those who won the lottery or either have come into some money, whether it was maybe through a lawsuit or something? Have you ever heard them talk about how things change after they get that money? 
I mean, they have new family members they didn't even know existed. They have new friends that come up. I mean, neighbors even want to come up that they've never had anything to do with, never wanted anything to do with the person. And all of a sudden, who's here? You know why? Solomon tells us right there, they want to help us spend that money. So Solomon also goes on and says that it causes anxiety. You know, if you ever heard any of the, of the successful people talk, you know, they always go to bed late and do what? Get up very early. Now he says that they can't sleep. You know, why can't they sleep? I mean, they're sitting there, they're worried about, is someone trying to take what I have away from? Money isn't the key to our happiness. We came into this world with nothing, and when we leave, we're leaving with nothing. There are no U-Hauls that make a trip to heaven. How many of you remember Ann Landers' column in the newspaper? Or how many of you remember his newspaper? <laughs> Let me read to you the following um, the following from Ann Landers' column that was printed in March of 1989. It says, Dear Ann Landers, the letter from the woman married to the tightwad she couldn't get an extra quarter out of him reminded me of my wonderful aunt who was beautiful, warm-hearted, and had a great sense of humor. Aunt Emma was married to a tightwad who was also a little strange. He made a good salary, they lived frugally because he insisted on putting 20% of his paycheck under his mattress because he didn't trust the banks. The money, he said, was going to come in handy in their old days. When Uncle Ollie was 60, he was diagnosed with cancer. Toward the end, he made Aunt M promise in the presence of his brothers that she would put the money he stashed away in his coffin so he could buy his way into heaven if he needed to. They all knew he was a little odd, but this clearly was a crazy request. Aunt Em did promise, however, and assured Uncle Ollie's brothers that she was a woman of her word and would do as he asked. The following, money, the following morning, she took the money, about $26,000, to the bank and deposited it. She then wrote a check and put it in the casket four days later. See, money is temporary. But you can use it to make a difference. You know, we give our, our tithes and our offerings here each Sunday morning. By giving, you are helping to spread the great news of Jesus Christ, not only here in our community, not only in our, our county, not only in our state, not only in our nation, but across this globe. Jesus warns us to beware, guard against every kind of greed. Life is not measured by how much you own. So what is the alternative to covetousness? It is contentment. Being content with what God has given you, trusting and being satisfied with what God has given you. Paul writes in Philippians 4.11, Not that I was ever in need for I have learned how to be content with whatever I have. You know, Paul was never content in the person that he was. He was always trying to grow, always trying to better himself as God wanted him to better himself. Not how those around him thought. But he was satisfied and content with everything that he had. So how can we be content? First, we must compare ourselves to God's standard of success instead of the world's standard. The world tells us to go out, get, 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 and get. You don't have enough, get more. They, 
Your neighbor has this. You go get it also. But don't you just go get it. You get something better. See, when we look at ourselves in God's standard, then our definition of success changes. The second thing we must do is to trust in God's sovereign plan in our life. God had a plan for you before you were ever born. He knew who your mom and dad would be. He knew exactly what you would, would be doing when you graduated. He knows what career you'll go to or go into. He called you for a specific reason. Remember, God called you, so don't pretend to be someone else. And then, learn to manage your expectations. You know, the world, especially today in, in our nation, it's all about, you owe me this. You know, I, I'm supposed to get this. You know what? Nobody owes us anything. God doesn't even owe us anything. But he loves us. He loves us in us. So that yet while we were still sinners, he sent his son Jesus Christ. God has, has promised to supply us our needs. Not our wants, just our needs. But anything above that is a pure blessing from God. So let me close here this morning with this one statement. God's plan for your life is unique. So refuse to compare yourself to others. Let's pray. Dear and Father, Lord, we just thank you for this day that you have given us, Father. We thank you for this time that we're able to, to just come together and take and open your word and, and look at it and know that you are our provider. That everything that we need, you will supply to us. And Father, that not only will you give us those needs, but from time to time you'll give us a little extra blessing to go along with. So, Father, as we come to this point in time, Father, we just ask that you would just move us in our hearts, whatever it is that we need to, to come and bring and, and drop it at your feet, Father. Give us the energy and the boldness to step out and to come and get right with you this morning. Father, for it's in your name that we ask these things.
So before we, we go this morning, we still have one thing that we still need to do. Our graduates can now move their tassels. And I also understand that some of you wanted a chance to throw your cap. So we're going to give you that opportunity here this morning. All right, we just ask that you throw it this way, all right, so that you don't knock, knock anybody's eye out, all right. So, so at this time, all right, let's congratulate our graduates once again. You may throw your hat. graduates to stand up here. We're going to ask that you come by. Please, no handshakes, no hugs, all right, unless you are their family. Um, you know, just come by and just congratulate them, all right, um, and just let them know how proud we are of them for reaching this milestone in, in their life. All right, so at, at this time, I want to ask Brother Jason if he would close us in prayer. <laughs> 